should not be like this. Hello, welcome back to another episode of the self development with Tactics podcast. Today we're talking about alcohol. <laughs> yes, the good old friend, alcohol, my buddy. No, not really. Uh, I don't actually drink that much. Uh, pretty rarely, to be honest. Uh, I do like it, though. Gotta be honest, I do like it quite a bit. Um, it is what it is, I'd say. But um, yeah, by Andrew Huberman. Very scientific, very informative, and also very, very, very useful and worth going through, I would say, um, regarding one's own consumption. Um, probably what is too much, what is <laughs> what is too little, nah. <laughs> what is too much, what uh, you should be thinking about. I was skipping through um, a few of the timestamps that we're having in front of us, which is, by the way, always really great to see when a video is having those timestamps, just because I know what I'm going to see and what I'm interested in. So everything that I'm not interested in, I'm just going to skip, period. Um, but also, uh, yeah, that's actually quite it. Let me show you, first of all, the title and so on and so forth. So what alcohol does to your body, brain and health by Andrew Huberman and the Huberman Lab podcast number 86. It's, it's having 1.3 million views. That's very interesting. And I yet do not see. It is really interesting. Sometimes I see uh, when a video was uploaded and sometimes I just don't see it for whatever reason. I still have not really figured that out. You know what this might be due to. But um, yeah, let's actually head into it. I have watched a bit of it. Apparently, I don't don't really remember it, but uh, I think it is a good one, as actually quite always. It is always quite a good one. Um, alcohol and serotonin, long-lasting effects, impulsivity, neuroplasticity, top-down inhibition. Let's actually go to long-lasting effects. They want to say. So the key thing to understand is that when people drink, the prefrontal cortex and top-down inhibition is diminished. That is habitual behavior and impulsive behavior starts to increase. Now, what's interesting is this is true in the short term, so after people have one or two, maybe three or four drinks, but it's also true that the more often that people drink, there are changes in the very circuits that underlie habitual and impulsive behavior. Okay, this is really important to highlight, so much so that I wanna drill into it a little bit more deeply. For the person that drinks, say, every Thursday night or every Friday night or goes out only on Saturdays but every Saturday, there's evidence that there are changes in the neural circuits of the brain that control habitual behavior and impulsive behavior, and they are modified and strengthened in ways that make those people more habitual and more impulsive outside the times in which they are drinking. And when they drink, impulsive and habitual behavior tends to increase even further. This is something that's not often talked about when discussing the effects of alcohol. I mean, we all know the effects of being drunk can be bad, right? Can be bad in terms of judgment, motor coordination, certainly driving drunk is a terrible thing, get you or other people killed and so on. But rarely do we hear about the changes in neural circuits from- Which I think, by the way, is the biggest thing. Um, maybe in general with alcohol and maybe even in general with um, driving that when you're having an accident driving, then it doesn't necessarily have to be due to your inability to drive or your inability to judge a situation or just your inability. Most often I think it is because of someone, someone that just, I don't know, goes badgered crazy and um, does some bullshit or is just, you know, not able to drive the car correctly and so on and so forth. So, um, I think this is a really big one, a really, really big one. Thinking about what am I doing to other people? You know, what can I cause to other people? Good and bad. And, um, you know, hopefully just really thinking about the good and also remembering that we can do just a lot of good shit to people. And also we can really be assholes and make their lives really bad. At least worse as it already is. And I mean, I've, I've talked about that Just before, more. but I'm often thinking about um, when I'm interacting with somebody, 
I better make sure that this person is at least feeling the same as before, as before I've talked to this person. I mean, if this person is feeling bad or worse afterwards, well, what the fuck did I do? If this person is feeling better afterwards, that's fucking amazing. Um, I don't know. I don't want to see it as a guideline or uh, I'm actually really loud today, but I don't really know why. Am I? Am I really loud today? I think I am. Am I? Hello? Now it is okay, I guess. Well, really strange. Anyway, um, might be a good guideline. One or two nights of regular drinking. Again, chronic drinking doesn't necessarily mean every day and every night. It could be the person that simply drinks every Thursday or every Friday or just once a week has three or four drinks or maybe even a few more. That person is going to experience a decrease in this top-down inhibition, so an increase in impulsivity and habitual behavior because the break on those behaviors has been removed while they're drinking, but also changes in the very neural circuits that allow habitual and impulsive behavior to occur more readily even when they're not drinking. And if you I mean, sorry for interrupting again, but this might just be the exact same thing that fortunately does happen when somebody is, is, is having, um, I don't want to say a trip uh, or, or did consume something psychedelic and is then rewiring the brain, but in a positive way, you know, as things are happening right now in a whole psychotherapy thing or uh, theme, <laughs> the whole uh, psychotherapy space that, you know, people could be using. And um, I think at this time we, we are researching that, you know, the, the, the details of that, you know, people can be using psychedelics to rewire their brain in a good way. I do also think that Andrew posted very recently a video on that, um, which might be really interesting. And it probably is just the exact same thing, uh, period. If you wanna know the actual substrate for that, the cellular substrate, I can briefly describe it. It's really interesting. Again, you don't need to know any biology to understand this. What it does is it increases the number of synapses, the actual points of connection in the neural circuits that control habitual behavior. So there's literally a growth of the neural circuits in your brain that lead to existing habit execution, right? The performance of things you already know how to do and a reduction in the neural circuits, or I should say a reduction in the number of synapses of the contacts within the neural circuits that are controlling behavior. So this again is a not often discussed aspect of alcohol intake. Fortunately, it is reversible. So in animals or humans that undertake a period of abstinence of anywhere from two to six months, these neural circuits were returned to normal, except in cases where people have been chronically drinking large volumes of alcohol for many, many years. And in those cases, while there is some recovery of brain circuitry after uh, people get sober, meaning completely sober, they stop drinking entirely, there is evidence of long lasting impact of heavy alcohol usage throughout the lifespan. But of course, this doesn't mean that anyone that's suffering from alcoholism or that used to should not continue to focus on their health. You absolutely should, all is not lost. But for people that have been drinking for a lot of years, maybe you went to college and you drank a lot in those years and your neural circuits change. If there's a period in which you don't drink alcohol, again, from two to six months and ideally longer, those neural circuits can then be remodified back to their original state. So let's consider some of the other neurochemical effects of alcohol on the brain and body. And again, for right now, we're confining the conversation to people that are drinking on average one or two drinks per night. Now, some people might think that two drinks per night is a lot, and a lot of that will depend on body weight. So for instance, people who weigh 110 pounds, for them to ingest two alcoholic drinks is going to be substantially different in terms of the biochemical effects than somebody who weighs 220 pounds, of course, Tolerance will also factor into this. Genetic background will also factor into this. And indeed, whether or not people have eaten will factor into this. So there are a lot of factors and we'll talk about that. For the time being, if you're curious about how food impacts the effects of alcohol and your feelings of being drunk, you may have heard, for instance, that if somebody's inebriated and they wanna sober up, they should eat something. Turns out that does not work. Here's how it does work, however. If you eat something prior to drinking alcohol or while ingesting alcohol, it will slow the absorption of alcohol into the bloodstream. In other words, you won't feel as drunk as fast. For many of you, this probably comes as no surprise. In particular, if that meal includes carbohydrates, fats, and proteins, okay? The inclusion of all three major macronutrients seems to slow the absorption of alcohol into the bloodstream far more than any 
than having any one of those or two of those macronutrients present. Now, if you are already inebriated or you've had a glass of wine or, or a beer and you eat something, chances are that alcohol has already made it into your bloodstream because it moves into the bloodstream so quickly. Again, it's fat soluble and water soluble. So within minutes, right, if, you're on, if you have an empty stomach, within five to 10 minutes, that alcohol is gonna be within your bloodstream and distributed throughout your body, maybe even faster depending on the type of alcohol and your metabolism. But if you're already drunk and you eat something, it's not gonna sober you up more quickly, but it certainly will blunt the effects of any additional alcohol that you might consume. And if you're somebody who is concerned about getting too drunk too quick, even from a small amount of alcohol, having some food in your gut can certainly be beneficial. Now, that's food and alcohol and the absorption of alcohol, but let's go back to talking about the biochemical and neurochemical effects of alcohol on the brain. We talked about top-down inhibition and we talked about habitual and impulsive behavior circuitry. There are also dramatic changes in the activity of neurons that control the release of so-called serotonin. Serotonin is a neuromodulator. It changes the activity of neural circuits and many neural circuits in particular. I don't know where he's heading now, but what I often see and feel and, and, and recognize is after a night of drinking, and I, I gotta be honest here, I do not drink that often, but when I drink, I tend to drink quite something, unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know, it depends on how you think about things. Um, but I also tend afterwards to actually be pretty depressed for whatever reason. Uh, and, you know, maybe he's explaining this right now then, but I've really recognized that. And it is really not nice. It really isn't. I also thought about, well, what if I... You know, it, it might just be about a pretty simple uh, me kind of uh, creating and producing so much serotonin or dopamine or whatever um, so that, you know, there is just some some backlash on that. Maybe it's, it's also the situation that one is in. You know, when I am engaging in activity that is very high serotonin, i.e. drinking with friends and then having a lot of fun and whatnot, maybe this is also just, you know... Uh, backing that down or just, you know, letting that backlash or, or just creating that backlash. But we will see, I guess. Are those involved in mood and feelings of well-being. Recently, there's been a lot of interest in serotonin because of a study that was released that showed pretty conclusively that serotonin levels can't really explain depression and depression-like symptoms. I want to make it very clear that although that study did show that serotonin levels are not necessarily associated with depression, the study was interpreted by many to mean that SSRI, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which uh, have the net effect of increasing serotonin, so these are things like Prozac, et cetera, that those drugs are somehow not helpful because they increase serotonin and serotonin isn't involved in depression. That logic doesn't really hold together, so I'm gonna use this as an opportunity to just clarify what really occurred there, and then we'll talk about how serotonin relates to alcohol consumption in things like feeling good and in depression. The key thing is this, SSRIs can help alleviate depression. That's right, SSRIs can help alleviate depression. They are often not always associated with side effects, dosage is very important, et cetera. But they probably support relief from depression by changing neural circuits, not necessarily by increasing serotonin itself. That is increasing serotonin with these drugs likely change the neural circuits involved in mood, allowing people to feel better through so-called neuroplasticity, which is the brain's ability to change itself in response to experience. So there's a bit of confusion. And again, I'm using this episode on, on alcohol to highlight some of the confusion because I think it's timely because the study just came out and there's a lot of chatter about this out there that when people are depressed, it's not necessarily because serotonin levels are low. However, if serotonin levels are increased with things like Prozac, Zoloft, and other SSRIs, oftentimes there is, yes, a relief from depression, but that's probably not because of restoring serotonin levels per se. It's probably because serotonin facilitates the changes in neural circuits that need to occur in order for people to feel elevated mood. Okay, so again, that's a bit of a tangent and aside, but I do think it's a vital one for people to know about. Again, if you're thinking about taking SSRIs, you're currently taking them and you've heard this news, definitely talk to your doctor. Again, there is great utility for some of these SSRIs and also in conditions like OCD, they've been shown to be very beneficial. So we really don't wanna throw SSRIs out as a potentially valuable treatment. 
Getting back to the effects of alcohol on serotonin, it's very clear beyond any doubt that many of the circuits in the brain that are involved in mood and feelings of well-being and also sort of self-image and how we see ourselves employ the neuromodulator serotonin and alcohol when we ingest it and it's converted into acetylaldehyde, it goes and that acetylaldehyde acts as a toxin at the very synapses, the connections between the serotonergic neurons and lots of other neurons. In other words, when we ingest alcohol, the toxic effects of alcohol disrupt those mood circuitries at first making them hyperactive. That's right, making them hyperactive. This is why people become really talkative. People start to feel really good after a few sips of alcohol, at least most people do. And then as they can ingest more alcohol or as that alcohol wears off, serotonin levels and the activity of those circuits really starts to drop. And that's why people feel less good. And typically what they do, they go and get another drink and they attempt to kind of restore that feeling of well-being and mood. Now, typically what happens is that as people ingest the third and fourth, maybe even the fifth drink, there's an absolute zero chance of them recovering that energized mood, right? Most people, as they drink more and more, will now start to feel more and more suppressed. The forebrain is now shutting down quite a lot. A lot of the motor cortical areas that control coordinated movement and deliberate movement start to shut down. So people start to slur their speech. People start to shuffle their feet. People forget their posture. People start to lean on things. People start passing out on couches. There's a great <laughs> depression, not depression of the psychiatric mm. depression sort, but a depression of alertness and arousal and eventually people will pass out. Now, I said most people because there's a subset of people that have gene variants or who are chronic drinkers or who are chronic drinkers and have gene variants <laughs> that as they ingest the third and fourth and fifth drink, what happens? They become more alert. They start talking more. They feel great. They have all sorts of ideas about the fun they could have that night. And they're the ones that if you've ever fallen asleep at a party for whatever reason, or you're getting tired and you're yawning, you're looking around the room and like these people are still drinking and partying and they're having what seems to be this amazing time. Often, not always, those are the future alcoholics in the room, or those are the people that have a genetic predisposition for alcoholism, or those are the chronic drinkers, the people who have built up enough of a tolerance or who have the chemical genetic makeup such that increasing amounts of alcohol make them feel better and better and better. And of course, they too have a threshold beyond which their nervous system will start to get diminished and they'll pass out and fall over, et cetera. But that threshold is way, way higher than it is for most people. Now, this is important to understand and it's important to understand because I think everyone should know and recognize their own predisposition and kind of risk in terms of developing alcoholism. It's also important to understand because it relates to the phenomenon of blackout. You know, many people think that blacking out is passing out, but blackout drunk is when people drink and they're talking and doing things. Sometimes sadly, they'll, or tragically, they'll often drive home or walk home or they'll hop on a bicycle and ride home or they'll go swimming in the ocean. All, of course, very dangerous activities to do when people are really drunk or even a little bit drunk in some cases. So these people will do these sorts of things and they do them because they have the energy to do them and they feel good while doing them, but they are doing them while the activity of neurons in the hippocampus, which is involved in memory formation, are completely shut off. And this is why the next day you tell them, hey, maybe we should talk about what happened last night. I'm like, well, what happened last night? I said, well, do you remember going to the party? Yeah, no, it was great. We did this, we did this, and then what? And it's very clear all of a sudden that they have no recollection of all the things they were doing despite being awake. Now, I wish I could tell you that there's some sort of blood test or other biomarker, even a fingerprint test that would allow you to determine whether or not you have a propensity to be one of these drinkers that has a predisposition for alcoholism. And if you've ever been blackout drunk, and certainly if you've been blackout drunk more than a few times, you should be quite concerned. And as we talk more about the more chronic effects and long lasting effects of alcohol consumption a little bit later in the episode, I think it will become clear as to why you should be concerned. But in any case, there is something that can tell you whether or not you might be in that category versus likely not in that category. And I alluded to this a couple of times already, but I wanna be really clear that when people drink, no matter who you are, initially there's that shutting down of those prefrontal cortical circuits. 
There's a gradual shutting down of the circuits that control memory. But then people divide into these two bins. And these two bins are the people who, after more than a couple of drinks, start to feel sedated. And the people who, after more than a few drinks, do not start to feel sedated. Now, of course, there's going to be differences created by how quickly people are drinking, whether or not they're combining different types of alcohol, uh, the types of alcohol, et cetera. But in general, that can predict whether or not you're somebody who has a predisposition for alcoholism or not. One also very interesting finding is that- I mean, it might also be about, uh, if you're thinking about your parents or when one is thinking about their parents, you know, whether they are already, um, is it alcoholists? I don't know. Um, but if, if they're already just, you know, really heavily relying on alcohol and are drinking quite a lot, might mean also something. I don't necessarily know if this gene is 100% going to be uh, uh, brought to you and given to you. Um, but I think, I mean, chances are higher than. I do know that Tim Ferriss apparently does have a predisposition for alcoholism. And he also once stated that he wished not to, to have drinking that much. Um, or at, at least an advice for his 20-year uh, old self would be not to drink that much. Um, well, I actually would just wanted to say, okay, uh, as long as you are still functioning, but no, nah, no. Nah. I think the, the long-term effects, and uh, even though apparently some of them are um, reversible, I think it is just not worth it. And one should be... Uh, conscious about these effects that alcohol is having on their on their body really uh, consciously about that consciously in the sense of knowing the risks and, and knowing the, the dangerousness of it and just I don't want to say don't drink I think <laughs> I mean if there was if there was another uh, another good option then, then probably it would be this good option since I think we all quite know that alcohol is really bad for us and, and maybe other drugs um, might be better. I don't know. Um, but I, I think at this point, I mean, it's just so in society, it is w what is being done and when one enjoys it, then I think one can do it consciously and uh, but just not that often, period. Uh, I wouldn't say, I don't know, once a week. I, I wouldn't also say once every month. I don't know. I mean, one should uh, just figure it out for for oneself and uh, also kind of track how one is feeling in, in the sense of, okay, I have drank that much and this much and whatever, and now I'm feeling this, that, and the other way. So maybe just uh, three beers is, is too much for you. I don't know. You know what I mean. <laughs> Alcohol changes the relationship between what's called the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland and the adrenals. Now the hypothalamus is a small collection of neurons about the size of a large gumball, it sits above the roof of your mouth, and it houses neurons that are responsible for some incredible aspects of our behavior and our mindset. Things like rage, things like sex drive, things like temperature regulation, very primitive functions including appetite, thirst, et cetera. Alcohol, because it can go anywhere in the brain, remember it's water and fat soluble, has effects on the hypothalamus. I'm just seeing for the podcast listeners, there is also a section with genetic predisposition, predisposition for alcohol and uh, consuming alcohol. I do not think that I'm going to have the time for going into that, but I just wanted to point it out. Um, in the case, I am not going to have a future episode on that either. Um, improving, replenishing gut microbiome, hangover alcohol, hangover, hangover types of alcohol and hangover severity. Um, this might be interesting just because I thought before, well, th does it really, since he stated it, um, like the, the types of alcohol and apparently combining them does make a difference. And I thought, well, um, <laughs> first of all, what are the types? And, uh, does it, does it really matter? Because I kind of heard it before and I thought, well, you know, ethanol is just ethanol and then that is quite it. But apparently um, it's, it's not Fine is really that the case, near it is, for instance, beer. The 
The consumption of beer, provided it is not overconsumption, right? It's not far beyond the tolerance of the individual. So it's one or two beers, is less likely to cause a hangover than say whiskey. And a glass of whiskey, or I should, you know, not a, as much whiskey as beer, of course, but a glass of whiskey, for instance, is more likely to cause hangover than gin is, it turns out. Again, this is what's fallen out of the data. And yet a glass of rum or red wine is more likely to cause a hangover than any of the other things I've mentioned so far. At the top, top, top of the list of drinks that induce hangover is brandy. And one could then say, well, doesn't brandy have a lot of sugar? Maybe it's the sugar that's causing hangovers. And this is something that's been, again, discussed over and over that people say, oh, it's the high sugar drinks that cause hangover. It turns out, however, that when one looks at drinks, alcoholic drinks and sugar content and hangover, at the very bottom of the list is, gosh, this makes me cringe just to think about, is ethanol diluted in orange juice. <laughs> Ugh. I can't believe people actually drink this, but ethanol diluted in orange juice. So this is not vodka and orange juice, okay? Vodka was third on the list from the bottom of drinks that induce hangover. Again, this is within amounts that are... Why would you fucking do that? Is, is, is ethanol that cheap so that, it, um, that it's worth it? I don't know, like... <laughs> makes me cringe, yeah. <laughs> comfortable for the person to drink that they have enough experience with or that they have the body weight to tolerate without getting very, very drunk. So the point is that if it were sugar that's causing hangover, well then the ethanol dilute in orange juice would probably be at the top of the list in, to, in terms of inducing hangover, but it's not, it's at the bottom of the list and brandy is at the top of the list. So what you find is that what scales from ethanol dilute in orange juice to beer, to vodka, to gin, here I'm ascending the hierarchy of things that cause hangover, gin, white wine, whiskey, rum, red wine, and then brandy at the peak, it's sort of the world heavyweight champion of hangover inducing drinks. Well, what's increasing are congeners within those drinks. Congeners are things like nitrites and other substances that give alcohol its distinctive flavor and that also lead to some of the mm. inebriating effects of alcohol. Now then you ask, okay, well, what is it that these congeners are doing and what are these nitrites doing? And guess what? While they do have effects on the brain and on other tissues, their main effects are to disrupt the gut microbiome. So what this points to again, is that having a healthy gut microbiome and perhaps ensuring that you bolster your gut microbiome the day after drinking is going to be especially important for warding off hangover or at least reducing the effects of hangover or the which is really interesting um that and uh, actually I, i gotta be honest yeah i've i've quite always skipped the whole things about gut microbiome and and why it is important and why you should be thinking about it and and so on and so forth uh maybe just because i uh do not really care about it and i think that i'm disrupting it quite on on a daily basis whether it is i don't know maybe due to Uh, high dosages of caffeine or coffee or sweetness that I'm consuming every day? Is it every day? I think at this point, it is not every day anymore, to be honest, which is interesting. Um, but still, I've always quite skipped that. And uh, probably what he is going to talk about there, um, or was talking about just before, because there was always another section of it, um, fermented food, sauerkraut, kimchi, and all the other things that um, people have been fermenting. I think also yogurt is fermented as far as I know and, and remember. But uh, ingesting these types of foods apparently is really healthy. And apparently is also one of the pieces of the puzzle of, of Andrew's daily intake of um, supplements, if you will, and or just you know things that he is ingesting ingesting to um, make sure that he is as healthy and as as good of a performer as he possibly can be. And there we go. With that being said, I am going to end the episode here. I kind of hear myself a bit differently today, which is interesting. And I don't know why, not necessarily. Maybe because I'm closer to the microphone. I don't know. Could be the case. Anyway, 
I wish you the best and I hopefully have been able and or Andrew has been able to spotlight certain ideas and certain things that are of value to you, which is my task here, spotlighting ideas, not saying that they are right or wrong or whatever. And I'm hopefully going to see you the next time. So remember to subscribe and I'm hopefully going to see you the next time. So bye bye. And now we got to wait for a bit so that my fucking outro is also in the video or in the stream or whatever. Yeah. See you.